planes, trains, and automobiles abandoned, under the moonlight, and after dark. Mix all those together and you get this book. Today, a conversation with author and photographer Ken Lee. Ken Lee is a California-based night photographer who spends a lot of time exploring weird places under the moonlight and capturing them with long exposures and doing some light painting just to make things interesting. Today's topic will be his new book, and we're going to dive into a few of the photos that made it into that book. He'll give us some insight on what went into those photos, what his inspiration was, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the rather unique gear he has been using to accomplish many of his fantastic compositions. Okay, so I want to welcome my good friend and uh, fellow night photographer, Mr. Ken Lee, and thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of what I know is probably a busy schedule right now to, uh, to do this. I appreciate you taking the time now because you've got an event coming up uh, in about a week that I, I think is a big deal. Will you tell people what's going on? I'm going to be presenting at Night Photo Summit 2022. And um, it's a virtual conference that's put on by National Parks at Night. And I will be talking about light painting angles. That is awesome. Um, you have been light painting now for... Well, several years at this point, but uh, it seemed to me that you really started doing this with a, was it the MASH truck? That was probably 2012. And at the time I was uh, teaching and I went into, uh, I went into the place where I usually teach for uh, school supplies. And I said, Hey, I've got this really um, new thing that I want to do that doesn't have anything to do with the classroom. I want to make gels. And it was that guy's idea to make um, gels to put over the flashlight to uh, give color to the light. But his idea was to create slides out of it and have a uh, have a cardboard surround. So that's that's what we did. And then we laminated it and, and the whole bit. Yeah, it was that, a pretty that great... sounds pretty ingenious because back in the day, we used to all run around with the theater gels <laughs> right, right. and they were um, right, right. They were like little mini sails because you would take them out of your envelope or whatever your storage was, and then they would just blow across the desert. You will be doing a presentation on light painting specifically? Light painting angles and how to create the most drama and uh, extract the most detail from the subjects. Uh, effective use of angles and uh, backlighting and things like that. It'll be approximately 45 minutes and it's going to be on February 4th, Friday, at... Well, it's um, I think it's 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Pacific oh, okay. Standard so Time. Okay, so lunch or dinner, depending on what coast you're you're on, it sounds like. <laughs> and <laughs> is right. that something that's going to yeah. be uh, recorded, and then you can uh, review that again somewhere else? Or um, okay, indeed, yes. Although it is a live virtual conference, everything is going to be recorded, and uh, so anybody who misses it. Mm -hmm. or even if you don't miss it, you can access the recordings for up to a year afterwards. Oh, wow. So let's talk about your new book. Um, it could have just been called uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, I suppose. Um, uh -huh. Oh, and look at that, Planes, uh -huh. Trains, and Automobiles. Boy, that seems oh, to fit. You know. What do you know? Oh, what do you know? Uh, I was really yeah. excited about this book. And and to be completely honest with you, I did, I did not crack this book open until last night because I wanted to sit down with a diet coke and some yacht rock and just absorb the whole thing right before talking to you so it was all fresh in my brain how did you decide on the content for this this book this is the only this is the only one that the publisher specifically suggested we were shooting ideas back and forth and i you know we usually do regionalized sorts of things with font hill media and you know america through time and all that but um for this one, he came up with the title and thought it was really funny, Abandoned Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. So we just went yeah, with that, it. Yeah, that did seem to fit pretty well because it turns out that when you open up the book, that's yeah. exactly what you, you see it, in sections. Uh, exactly when I had spoken right. to Mike about his book and, and all the research he had done, 
I, I saw a lot of the same level of research on the vehicles that you had done, especially the planes. I thought that was really fascinating. In the case of Eagle Field, I know the owner. <clears throat> so um, a lot of times I would ask him, hey, what's this? I would show him the folder, uh, folder. I would show him the photo and uh, ask what that was. Other times I would, uh, I would write down approximately what it was you know, write down uh, white Chevy approximately 1930s and then go and research it and then figure it out on my own. But he, he was invaluable for that. Would you say that Eagle Field is a place that you would um, revisit? Is that something that you feel like you, you've gotten a lot out of and can get more if you've gotten pretty much all you can? I feel like I could revisit that quite a few more times because every single time I show up there, I'm really inspired. And also the owner... He, he's constantly acquiring new things or moving things around. So even if it's the same subject matter, you know, the same vehicles or what have you, they're frequently in different places where you can gain better access to them or just simply different access. Um, plus, there's so much stuff there. There's just so much stuff. It's a gold mine of material. Could you describe your, your type of night photography? Like what, what is the process? for that long exposure, short exposure, you know, what's the, what's the Ken Lee look? I would say it's, it's definitely long exposure and, and it sort of depends on when I'm doing it. But uh, for a lot of the photos in the book, there are probably about two or three minute exposures at F8, low ISO, typically 200 or something like that, unless, uh, unless there's some cloud cover. And um, typically you're, on or near a full moon so so the rest of the landscape is lit pretty well and um that's that's probably the environment i enjoy most but there's certainly some milky Way photos and things like that which are much shorter exposures typically 15 or 20 seconds instead and another thing i like doing sometimes is um i also like to try and light paint from the same angle as the moon because um, one of the inspirations is that I'll come across something and I'll really, really like the way the moon is shining on it. But if I photograph it just like that, it'll come out a little bit, a little bit flat looking. So I like to goose it along by by using the same angle as the moon is uh, shining on the subject. So it just yes, pops a little bit that's, more. Yeah, that's that's a really effective thing because you can't control the position of the moon or the position of that subject. You're kind of, you know, you're there and it is what it is. Um, do you prefer when you, when you're out shooting on a moonlit night, do you prefer to shoot, you, you know, earlier or, or later in the evening, you know, when the moon's low, do you like the moon overhead? Did, is there a preference for you that you kind of look for when you go out? I love when the moon is low, when the moon is Be low. because of the not, like shadows. Yeah. Long shadows. It, it, not, yeah. I, I love the long shadows and, um, there's typically more texture, the light is less flat, and things just look more appealing. But um, I feel like if, if the moon is um, directly overhead, there's still some pretty good photos to be had. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's, um, it's I, I guess it good. just depends on the subject, really. Uh, yeah. I've, there's been some stuff that I've been out shooting, and then I notice it gets a little bit late, and that moon gets right overhead, and things kind of flatten out. They don't mm -hmm. look as awesome anymore. And mm -hmm. then I think, I think I'll come back tomorrow you know, um, earlier, uh, or, you know, you wait a couple hours if you're going to be there the whole night and kind of revisit it later when that moon's dropped down a little bit. That's the thing too, is if, if, you're, That's the if, thing too, is if, if you're in a, if you're in a location that has a lot of things to photograph, you can kind of mentally prepare by walking around and saying, Hey, in about two hours, this is going to look really great. And the moon won't be shining flat against the surface. So I'll come back later, but I'll do this other other automobile or other train right now and and that's that's a pretty good way of going about things i think if if you have that much yeah, material like an eagle to field, photograph. for instance because because in a place yeah, like exactly, that which exactly. is heavily featured in your book you have um you have the planes you have the cars but then you also have things that are inside buildings and you can go in and and you know heck if the clouds rolled in that night you could still just go in a building that's pitch black and light paint all night inside and um, be completely independent of the weather. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Eagle Field, going inside a building is also a great way of escaping <laughs> yes. mosquitoes. You did mention that in, in your book and you mentioned your, your friend who got 
basically eaten alive. I have a feeling I know who that is. Uh, and <laughs> and yes. having been there before, I, I, I know that it can be, be uh, pretty vicious. I love this shot. What a great, what a great choice for the book because um, you've got beautiful moonlight. Looks like the moon was pretty high at that point. You've got your interior light painting, and then you've got some star trails going on. And I know that's something that you you also like to do. When you're doing a shot like that, how much time do you look to invest in order to get nice star trails like this? <laughs> that just, <laughs> that just um, depends. Um, it, it, it depends on whether I'm using one camera or two and uh, how impatient I am or whether I'm going to eat dinner or <laughs> just depends. You're, you're the only person I've ever shot with who brings a second camera. I, I almost never see that. Um, so that means you have two tripods and you probably have two shutter release cables and yeah. you have a bag of batteries and um, you'll just set up over there somewhere get that running and then you'll go do your thing mm -hmm. and uh you get some really great stuff and you you're very efficient because you're not just standing around waiting for that to finish you have your other camera so a lot of times i let that dictate how long how long the exposure is so for example if i take 20 minutes on a setup that means the other camera has been mm -hmm. clicking away for 20 minutes and then and then i just keep going and going and going so quite frequently when i have two camera setups go for 15 or 20, 20 for this minutes. shot do you remember about how long you went? I have no earthly idea. I have no <laughs> earthly idea. <laughs> um, it, it'll say so in the book because I have all the camera settings in the book for every single photo. So it'll it'll definitely say that, but I uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. You've done a, a fair amount of Star Trail uh, work in your book. And uh, one of the first photos that I wanted to talk about was this one. You got access to one of, I think according to your book, this is one of two aircraft that was used to um, shuttle the shuttle around, to move the space shuttle around the country. Is that right? That's exactly right. That's yeah, exactly that's, right. That's a fantastic shot. Wow. What, what great access. How did you, how do you get access to a, a place like that? Is that, um, I just look for interesting things and then I contact them with a, Typically by email, sometimes I'll call if I have a phone number. Uh, I prefer calling if I can, so I can, you know, kind of make a make a connection with the person. And I basically tell them that I'm, uh, I absolutely love uh, what the place is about, whatever that is. I'll usually do a little bit of research so I'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and I'll also mention that I'm a responsible night photographer who has That's insurance. Important. <laughs> and yep <laughs> it is it is and um typically show them what i'm doing yep. what i'm interested in doing maybe okay. provide a link to my website and a lot of times that's that's what gets gets me in so this person was really really excited about about the opportunity and in fact she uh she accompanied me on uh some of these uh some of these setups and uh was really interested in in the a photography aspect of it and we just had yeah, a lot this of fun. shot is is really interesting to me i i i selected it for a couple different re reasons one is that i thought the um the focus on here especially the the engine right in front of you was really on point and i wanted to ask you that is this a shot that you had to do any focus stacking on or was this something that was just you know basically straight out of camera as far as the the foreground goes there's no focus stacking and at this this was taken in um may 2015 i probably didn't even know how to focus stack gotcha. back then anyway uh so so yeah my photoshop skills are pretty rudimentary in many aspects so no i i focused exactly where you think i did okay. you know right on the engine uh to to me that's that's the subject that's the whole that's the whole meat of this photo so that's what i wanted as sharp as possible um but also if you're doing star trails, do you really need to have sharp star trails? No, no I, I, I don't think so. And, and they looked they look fine yeah. for this shot. I, I didn't think at all that um, that was really an issue. And chances are you were you were shooting. Do you remember what aperture you were at? I don't remember. It was um is it's probably around f eight yeah. because I prefer to shoot around that. This was a two hour and twenty one minute wow. star trail, if I recall correctly. So you had a second camera with you that night, I assume. Oh, absolutely. 
Yeah, this one is ta this one is taken with an APS-C sensor camera. It's a it's a Nikon D7000, which came out in I want to say 2010, 2011, something like that. And so this was my you know quote backup camera at the time. My other camera at this point would have been a Nikon D610. Okay, and obviously you did some of your own lighting here. How many different I did. areas on that shot did you did you light from? I kind of have a feeling based on what I'm seeing, but um. When you when you went in there, chances are you had to overpower. Maybe there's some light pollution nearby too, um, and and Correct. was does that dictate how you light paint? Yeah, for this one, I kept it pretty natural. Um, so I used a warm white light, and um, you know, just trying to mimic the ambient light around me, basically. And I definitely, I definitely illuminated the the engine right in front, but I also went in the back, and I. Sh I made sure that I illuminated the NASA logo that's um, on the uh, on the tail because that was really important to me. In fact, the whole idea of this was not only, you know, obviously the engine is front and center, but I purposely set up my camera in such a way that the NASA would peek through because to me that was that was a big it's part of really the It's really well framed just how that little NASA just right in the corner, but you, the way that the wing uh, comes down and creates that little corner right there, the juxtaposition of the NASA logo. I mean, that just, just looks fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. I remember walking around with my camera for a little while, just trying to get the optimal angle. You know, I wanted these star trails to be in the back and I wanted them to be circular. And then I wanted the NASA, the NASA logo to show up in the large, the large, uh, engine in the front and that's the thing that gives it the context yeah the story. It, it, that's like the cherry on the on the top here yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it really is <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. what struck me about this photo th this is why i picked it is i love the the mystery of the reflections of the the lighting on the the bottom part of the engine kind of going away um it creates i, I don't know what the environment was there for you but it almost creates the illusion to me that this plane was actively on a on a taxiway or it was it was kind of ready to go like it was a runway when you're walking around in a place like that or eagle field any one of those uh are you actively looking at how the stars are going to kind of swirl are you looking for that north star point to get that or is that sort of just like a you know if it works out fine if not it's not a huge priority it depends on the shot but for this one uh, I was definitely conscious of that. I, I really wanted wanted it to circle circle in the back. And even though the circles are often blocked by the plane, you can still, it, your mind just fills it in and you know that it's a complete circle anyway. There's other other photos like, for example, the, the Aeropuerto de Nazca uh, truck that, that uh, you showed. Yeah, there it is. That one... I didn't really care. Uh, I I knew approximately what the star trails would do, but I didn't I didn't really it 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 didn't make or break the composition. Whatever they did was fine. It kind of worked me. out because um, you've got the sort of the weight of the truck in the on the lower side, and then you can see how the stars are mm -hmm. circling up towards the opposite corner. Yeah, I knew approximately what the stars would do, but I didn't. I didn't go for any precise angles or anything like that. Uh, my my sole thought was on on the angle of the truck itself, and not so much the stars. Gotcha. Yeah, because ultimately that's that's what the photo's for. That's where the eyes are going to go. Maybe not so much yeah. towards the the stars. I think with certain angles, especially an angle like that, if it was a shorter exposure or you had some cloud cover come in in whatever direction that was moving, it it all would have worked, regardless. The sky was the icing on the cake. You bring up an interesting thing because now when it's clouds moving, I'm really conscious of that because I so often love when the when the uh, the clouds kind of whoosh by and they they frame the subject. I just love that. Oh, That's one of my bet. favorite yes, things. Absolutely, I love the uh, you yeah. Know, if you can line it up so the clouds are moving either towards you or away from you, and you can get those nice lines. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's one of my favorite things. All right. So I've got another shot that I want to ask you about, and it kind of goes along the Star Trail theme, but it's a um, it's a much different subject. And it would be this. Uh, wow. Uh, it's it's very menacing. 
<laughs> this truck. Um, where, you know, if you, if you can't talk about specifics, that's fine. But where, where generally speaking was this? About four or five miles from the border of Mexico and California. And uh, so, yeah, this is a, a really, really old truck. I, I forgot what, uh, what year it is, but um, uh, I was really, you know, sort of captivated by how menacing this is. And to me, I was approaching this, this photo as if it were, you know, basically like a monster, a giant living, breathing thing. And, and so that's, that's kind of what, you know, what allowed my imagination to take over and, you know, how, how I chose to light it because I was picturing the headlights as, as wing eyes and that kind of thing. So Yeah, it yeah. looks like um, it definitely has a face. There is something very different about this shot compared to the other two. Mm. And it has to do with perspective and a piece of equipment that I think you're using that you weren't using in the other ones. Right. What would right. that be? That would be a Rokinon 12 millimeter fisheye lens. Yes. I was just having so much fun. And to me, part of the part of the fun of experimenting is uh, working with different lenses that aren't traditional to night photography. Yeah, because it, it gives you um, a creative challenge, which, yeah. which yeah. sometimes you walk into a location and, and you think, well, all right. But then you put that fisheye on there and you're like, all right. Boom, instant, Boom, instant creativity <laughs> yeah. too. Because it, it, there have been some times when... I was kind of not mentally into what I was doing or I was distracted or thinking about other things and realizing that I was, you know, in a little bit of a creative yeah. funk, I would, I would slap that fish eye on and then instant weirdness, instant creativity. <laughs> the the fish eye is almost like an artistic palate cleanser for the evening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, how long have you had that fish eye for at this point? That is a good question. Um, it's probably been three or four years I don't at least, know. I think. I, 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 least, I can, yeah. I can tell in, in the book uh, which photos are a little older and which are newer because of the, the prominence of the, the fisheye <laughs> <laughs> and how you utilize it. But it's a fantastic tool. I, I'd recommend it to anybody. I mean, if you're going to do panos or whatnot, but it really lends itself well to the type of work that you do because um, – you can really pull out some interesting, you know, faces and, and things like this that you would not have been able to get with just a straight on regular 15, 1530 lens. Yeah, the distortion really uh, lets everything kind of run amok. So, um, you know, and, and another thing I love doing is uh, taking the fisheye and jamming it really close to something because you can pick up some extraordinary detail and then have everything else fall off. Yeah, it's very forgiving on the focus end as, as well. That too, yeah. yeah. Uh, what really is great about using a fisheye in, um, a junkyard or a busy area, which you show throughout the book is that you don't have to, it doesn't have to be obvious that it's a fisheye because you don't really have a horizon that you're working with, so to speak. You've got a lot of activity and it almost masks the fact that there's a, a, a horizontal distortion. So if you're first looking at this image, you're kind of like, there's something different here. What, what's different? Um, and, and it's the, how the fisheye pulls the front of that truck right at you, but doesn't really reveal that it's it's a fisheye, in my opinion. You can start to see that the the horizon is in the shape of a, a, a very shallow smile. Yes. So, but, but, but you have to look at it for a little bit, I think. Yeah, yeah, you, you definitely do. Uh, it, and here, it, it really pulled out, it, it pulls the... It pulls the grill of the vehicle towards you, but pushes the windshield away from you. Right. Because realistically, right. when you when you look at this vehicle, it doesn't really look like that. It it almost looks like a clown car. You can fit maybe one one adult clown in there, <laughs> or maybe fifty. I don't know clown physics, but uh, we'll do another talk about clown math at some point. But uh, that's one of the beauties of the fisheye is how you can you can you can really compress and push and, and all that. So well done on that shot. You did uh, red light in here. And uh, I noticed that that's um, a color that you you've probably used more than other colors on uh, vehicle interiors. Uh, do you have a particular reason for that? Or is that just, you know, just sort of part of your process? Also, it. Um, it often uh, creates a sense of unease or alarm 
Um, it evokes danger, and and sometimes sometimes I want to impart that. So in the case of this, initially looking like a monster or something like that, I wanted to you know kind of you know amp that up a little bit by uh, creating creating some red light. I noticed in the the background of this shot in the cab you projected a shadow of the steering wheel onto the windshield was that intentional yeah i'm always trying to look for um you know what kind of shadow i can do to create um you know a greater sense of mystery or interest or things like that here is a photo that i've seen before i was happy to see it in the book and it is so different on a bunch of different levels uh do you travel with the bunny or was the bunny already in there when you got there <laughs> I have to confess I was traveling with the bunny. <laughs> so this was a last minute trip to Eagle Field, which is where this uh, where this photo was taken. And this was taken on Halloween um, during a full moon. And I thought if I'm photographing Halloween and a full moon, I'm going to take I'm going to take some of these, you know, kind of rather creepy looking dolls and that includes the bunny i took a couple of other things but it, <laughs> hey it's it's halloween yeah uh we've all seen really weird creepy stuff inside of uh, vehicles before so it, it could have been um saint patty's yes. day fourth of july or christmas for all i know in that case but yeah it's it's a really cool shot and what's neat about it, it besides the fact that it's a it's a furry bunny is the fact that you've got this um really kind of fun color in what's otherwise a sort of dystopian setting. I mean, if you look sort of around the vehicle, you've got all those cobwebs uh, over around the dash. And then it looks like you've got springs behind the bunny. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the most festive item for the most drab backdrop. Sort of cute little bunny, but, but then the bunny doesn't really look like it's in great shape either. You know, it, it looks like it's, um, maybe seen better days, you know, the fur is a little matted and what have you. Then on top of that, remember, we, we just talked about um, my love of uh, using different yes. lenses and things like that. Uh, so in addition to a fisheye, I'm using a quasi tilt shift lens. Uh, it's a lens baby and it's an edge optic 35. That's why I case. threw this photo in here specifically because um, I wanted to showcase your... Ah. Um, your your love or your affinity for kind of oddball lenses for night photography that a lot of people just don't even think about and tilt shift is certainly one of those things i don't know many people um i don't really know anybody other than you that's actively using it for night photography yeah i don't think i know anybody who's doing it not actively anyway not as what, much as i what's, do <laughs> what's really striking about this image is is twofold in terms of what you use to focus this subject. And I, I'm speaking of this figuratively. One is you've got your, um, you've got your tilt, tilt shift lens. So you've really forced everything around the bunny to be somewhat out of focus and just kind of, you know, ethereal, but you, you also dialed in the viewer by doing some really nice lighting on here. So you've got two different ways to kind of bring your eye in. Uh, was this just a um, uh, just a, a quick white light over the the top of the bunny? Exactly right. Yeah, I used the Proto Machines LED two and uh, held it uh, directly over the bunny um, and just popped it real fast. I don't remember, but it was probably just you know like a second or so. Um, then um, from you know going back a little bit outside, you lit from multiple angles. It. Did yeah, you do yeah, it all three in different one angles. Exposure, or was this a? You did, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, almost, yeah, almost all my light oh, painting is done in one exposure. Okay. So when you do a shot like that, how many attempts did it take you to get this? Or are you pretty confident in, in these situations where you just go in and say, "This is what I need to do." Bing, bang, boom, I'm done. There's some times in which I luck out and I nail it on the first try, and I can do that with things like Joshua trees and stuff like that because I've done quite a few of them and. Um, you know, I'm pretty confident in my ability to uh, photograph trees, especially Joshua trees. But this, I'm guessing it probably took about three, four yeah, tries. Yeah, you're, I've watched you light paint. I saw you light paint some Joshua trees recently, a couple months ago. That was interesting to see because mm -hmm. I've seen your photographs of Joshua trees, but I've never seen you actually light them before. Um, so uh, 
I have the added uh, bonus of seeing the behind the the scenes as well. I know you're somewhat of of a perfectionist. Yeah. I think when it comes to this kind of stuff, because I have seen you go after yeah, subjects so. with lights uh, for a while just to get it right, um, which I find interesting because some people shoot for volume and some people shoot for quality. And um, I don't think you're, I don't think you're someone who yeah. wouldn't wouldn't mind spending an hour on a subject just to just to get it right. If I'm really excited about something and and I know there's a good shot in there, I'll spend an hour or whatever um, lighting it correctly or even adjusting, uh, making minute adjustments on the camera, uh, the you know, the angle or what have you, just just so I know that there's something in there. You definitely have found subjects that you revisit um, again and again. And I'm going to go back mm. and reference your book cover uh, because as I'm going to show over the next minute or so here, uh, several other images that you've taken of this particular truck. Um, so I'd, I'd love to ask you, what is your um, creative affinity with this, this vehicle? What is it that draws you back to it so frequently? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, I just love the way the, uh, the truck looks. It's a 1937 uh, Ford fuel truck. But the other thing is that, as you can see, it says Aeropuerto de Nazca. And so this truck was used in an Indiana Jones movie. It was, uh, I believe, the one about the crystal skull, if I recall correctly, which wasn't the greatest movie, but it's, hey, it's Indiana Jones. I love Indiana Jones. So every time I go field, I take at least one no photo kid. of this. So um, I, I think I saw that movie. I think that was one of those movies that a lot of people are like, I think I saw it, but I don't remember anything about it. Have you seen the truck? in the movie were you able to spot it have you looked for it so i hate to say this but no because um the movie was bad was bad enough that i haven't watched it since then i really should go back and watch it though it's i know the truck takes place when um they're allegedly landing in peru or it's it's at the airport in peru or things like this and eagle field was a stand-in for that ah okay a lot of people will take portraits of the same person over and over again, and no one no one ever stops to say, hey, why do you keep taking photos of that person? But, it, you know, therefore, it's not really different for, for us. You have gone into Pearsonville, which is an, another uh, place in the book, a, a junkyard out in uh, outside of Lancaster, California, and um, shot that with some beautiful starry skies that I've never been able to get in to see just because it's been the wrong time of the month. Yeah, I've yeah, gotten a couple um, of Milky Ways do, there. Do you find yeah. that you'll revisit a location specifically because it's a different time of the month and you could get different skies out of it? Is that Does that ever enter in your, your plan? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes so I plan for that. So you would say yeah. each location is good for at least two visits <laughs> for, for that re potentially. <laughs> I think so. And especially, you know, a place like Pearsonville or what have you. I mean, there's there's so much there or was so much there that uh, I mean, you could you could go there 20, 30, 40 times and and still come away with really deeply yeah, original much, photos. Much like Eagle Field, mm -hmm. which is actively being mm -hmm. maintained and seems like it has things added to it, which which is fun to go back to because you never know what you're going to find there. Yeah. Although sometimes you you find out that something's gone, and that's disappointing too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes that can be heart wrenching, you know, because you feel like you you really have an affinity for it, and you have a connection, and it's like, oh no, that's it's gone yeah. now, or it yeah, got that, that's Pearsonville for a lot of us who went in there and shot, um, especially starting off with the workshops with Troy Pava, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. We, we've talked about planes, and we've talked about automobiles uh i want to just touch on the trains real quick i'm going to throw a couple photos up of some of the uh, trains out of your your book um there seems to be a fair amount of uh old railroad activity out in the the southwest uh you in the book feature some diesel locomotives down near um the mexico border then there's these uh, metra metric cars that um, I believe mm -hmm. they were brought out of Chicago. Nobody really knows what was going on with them. We had some out in the Berkshires here at some point too that ended up getting crushed and sold for scrap metal. Um, I don't know what happened. Uh, and you've walked, you know, over um, miles, railroad tracks and bridges to get to these places. 
Um, one thing I noticed on um, some of the locations, too, is there's a lot of graffiti popping up now. There is, and it seems to be a particularly large problem lately, you know, in the past few years. Uh, there's there's a lot of graffiti. Several places have burned in the Mojave Desert. So it's definitely a concern for a lot of us who are, you know, kind of um, historically minded and into preservation and things like that. So, yeah, it's definitely do you, do you, a huge concern. Do you walk into a location like the Metro cars, for instance, which were heavily covered in graffiti? Do you look at that and Heavily. say, um, yeah, I'm not going to shoot this. Or do you say, okay, this, it is what it is. I'm going to make the, the best out of it. Have you ever walked to a place and say, nah, it's not going to work for me? Or is that just part of the location at this point? No, I, I've i never done that. Usually I know in advance that it's going to be heavily tagged. So I just uh, go ahead. And uh, there's some times in which... Um, I'll try and approach it so I'm not highlighting the greedy and things like that. But there's other times in which I'll just let the whole thing fly and think it is what it is. But but there's there's this one building that I photographed. I don't think it's in any of my books. Maybe it is. I, I don't remember. But um, it's a mission style. It's a mission style uh, building. You know, with with great archways and things like that. That's heavily tagged. It's in the Antelope Valley, and I purposely back lit that one so it wouldn't highlight a lot of the graffiti and i think it looks good like that there is a there so. is a photograph in your book from a um an old missile complex not far from where you live i think and a big burned out mm, um, mm. city bus and and it was uh, under less than ideal conditions the the photo shows pretty cloudy sort of milky skies that night yeah the first time out there the the fog rolled in just uh, when i had just started shooting the fog rolled in so but i just kept shooting anyway because, yeah and you know, you know it's what? part of the fun the graffiti <laughs> on that it kind of worked there it, it, in my point of view just because there yeah. everything else was so sort of um flat as far as the light goes that's all you had to work with that the graffiti kind of made some things pop a little bit when when you go out to the uh, I've seen a lot of your work in the um, car forest outside of Goldfield, Nevada or Nevada. <laughs> and and there that works. People go in there and expect to see that kind of stuff. Yeah. When, you know, like a lot of people, when I first started going there, it was the original artwork uh, by Chad Sorg. And throughout the years, you can see it shifting. You'll see more broken windows and. Uh, more graffiti, then it'll get painted over again in an interesting manner, then the graffiti comes again. And so that's, you know, shifted over the years. But um, I feel like you can always get some interesting photos there. I mean, there's, you know, what, 35, 40 vehicles jammed at strange angles into the earth. You know, you should be able to get some <laughs> yeah, cool photos yeah, out of that. that. <laughs> the weirdness supersedes the graffiti that you may not like in that case. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel like for someone like you who lives out in that area, in Southern California, that the, the challenge to shoot um, non graffitied uh, structures is, is getting limited. Yeah. Like, even, I mean, there have been some places where I drove on dirt roads for, you know, what, like 15 miles or so, only to find that it too is tagged. Um, now, most of those, it's usually it's usually graffiti artists. So it's not just these random bubble letters or things like that. It's usually somebody who's yeah. attempting to create art. So as, as far as this book goes, um, it came out in, it officially got released around November. That's about right. Yeah. It was either and late you October or on, November. Uh, you can, I'm assuming you can get it through your website, through my website, uh, Ken Lee photography.com. And you can also buy it through Amazon, Barnes and Noble oh, awesome. and target. Okay. Although targets probably online since they typically don't have bookstores. That's you know, true. Although there is a small book section in the target where I'm near where I am. So you, you never oh. really know. You may be working on some other books. I am. Yeah. I've got uh, two more, possibly three more, but two more that, um, that I've signed okay. contracts for. The next one is actually going to be um, what your sign in back of you is. It's uh, going to be okay. Route 66. Night photography. All, all of it wow. is night photography, history, and uh, personal stories and experiences and things like that. And also, um, you know, it, it'll be for photographers as well, because I'll, I'll continue putting the camera settings underneath the captions and things like that. Route 66, though, is a pretty long road that goes through a 
lengthy part of the country. Yes, and I'll just okay. be doing so a little bit of this. I didn't know if you, um, <laughs> you had some road trip ideas in mind or if you're just focusing on a on a particular section or it'll it'll be a particular section it'll be the southwest nice. section of route 66 but um you never know uh there might be uh some companion volumes in which i uh okay. go a little bit farther east but you know since i'm here and i'm i'm not even terribly far from route 66 it's relatively easy to start in my backyard and you know go to arizona or what have you so uh, I'll be going on a trip to Arizona next week. Uh, I'm sorry, next month, and uh, maybe I can slip in a Route 66 photo or two uh, do, while do I'm out that way. Do you feel like at this point you've you've got enough, uh, or is this a kind of a work in in progress, just in terms of collecting the uh, the photos for those books? I have enough right now that I could uh, I could uh, create a Route 66 book, but I'm still photographing. I like to have too much to choose from so I can pick favorites. I think it's a little stronger that way, but uh, I definitely have the requisite 140 photos or whatever it is. You know, yeah, it's about 140 gotcha. photos okay, in each well, book. Well, that's great. So we can look forward to um, a couple more books, night photography themed with settings, stories, yeah. interesting locations. Um, Route 66, mostly abandonment. Any photos of places that are um, been, you know, there seems to be a revival happening in parts of it here and there. Um, or are you really focusing on those places that time has forgotten? I'm really focusing on abandoned. I'm really focusing on abandoned things, but you know, some of them I'm kind of fudging. Like for for example, you were with me in October when we were photographing Amboy, and uh, so I'll I'll have a few photos of that because it, it, obviously at one point it was abandoned. But you know, some of my photos will clearly show the the sign being lit. Um, so, so, you know, I'm fudging a little bit on that, but, um, a lot of the photos of Amboy are genuinely abandoned because for instance, the motels still, you know, are a progress and, and some of the surrounding buildings around there are still, still being built. But, um, it, you know, certainly a photo with the, with the lit sign in there is fudging a little that bit. That sign is fantastic though. <laughs> I mean, how could you not? It, yeah. Yeah, I love that sign. No, it, 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 yeah, has, it to has to be done. To be done. Absolutely. I mean, so, they put a lot of money, I'm assuming, into getting that sign relit, so it should get some should get some attention. Yeah. And I I have photos of it before they lit oh. it. So, uh, you know, with the yep. paint peeling a little bit. So, so I'll include those in there too, but but otherwise, you know, it's yeah, it's there's a lot of um um places that are going to be in the book that people don't really think about that that are definitely on one of the old alignments of route 66 but uh they're not really well-known places and so i'll be featuring those oh, as great. well okay so these these are these will probably be some photos that people haven't seen a a bunch of popping up online these might be little little mystery places yeah some of them are some of them are uh, mystery places they're pretty obscure and then other places are places that people drive past constantly for instance uh you mentioned two guns and there's twin arrows and things like that that people have been driving past for the last 25 years as it's been abandoned uh so so those will be heavily and the, featured and the key as well. to getting a lot of this stuff out there is to show what it looked like at that moment because things are constantly changing the entropy of the desert waits for no one and places that I shot with you even just a couple of years ago. And you mentioned two guns, the camp building, you know, right, the camp building. Yeah. We were all surprised when, uh, when it had completely pancaked, it was flat. And, uh, you know, the, the, the roof was resting on the ground. And I thought that's no, nope, no, nope. it looked, and it looked like an inside job too. So who knows, <laughs> who knows, but, um, yeah. you are, you think from a standpoint of these types of books that you are getting something that's been sitting around for 30 or 40 years unchanged outside of maybe graffiti, but you're really getting things that are quickly disappearing too. You are getting something at that particular time. Uh, this coming Friday, the first Friday of February, you'll be doing a 45 minute mm. how to light painting, night photography angles at the, um, Night Photography Summit, and that's sponsored by the National Parks at Night folks. If you're out there and you are interested in learning more about Ken and hearing him talk a little bit more in depth about his night photography and light painting, that would be a fantastic 
option. And based on what you told me earlier, Ken, you'll be able to view that for up for a year. Both books currently available on your website and Amazon and Barnes and Noble and even Target. Right. If, if you want it signed, go through my website. If you just want to purchase it, uh, which you can do for a little bit cheaper, uh, okay. go to Amazon or somewhere else. Signed books are on the table. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time tonight to yeah. um, have this chat with me. I know you've been busy getting ready for that other event. So uh, taking the time away from that. I, hopefully I gave you a little bit yeah, of a definitely. break, but I know the people watching really appreciate your insight on your your photos. Your photos are fantastic. I, I love watching you shoot. I have that extra benefit of being able to interact and, and, and watch you do your creative process. But yeah, thanks, Tim. Yeah, we, we have a lot of fun going on those trips and everything. So so I look forward to the next one with yeah, uh, you and Mike abs- and George. Absolutely. So absolutely. Yeah. So be well, yeah. uh, stay healthy, stay warm. Good luck in Arizona. And I look forward to our next photo thanks. adventure. All right. Bye.